Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my first guest is going to be Ian McKay, a writer, lecturer, curator, situationist, editor of Art North magazine. And uh, we covered a lot of things in our conversation, um, how he got started, the art world, uh, various controversies that he's been involved with, um, the sublime, academia, um, regional art, uh, Scotland, Art North when it happened, uh, and his knowledge of the Balkans and that, that area where he's worked a lot and been in contact with him is particularly per pertinent now. And we also talk about his new project, Art North Review. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for doing this, Ian. I understand you're very busy. You've got all sorts of things to contend with. And uh, certainly <laughs> there's a lot to cover. I mean, it's, <laughs> there's, having read through all the things, um, there's yeah. loads of points of discussion and we could be for here for hours, I think. I hope all good. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, for sure. I mean, just, you know, it's all art interest and the, the sub, that subject in, in all its diversity. So yeah, so much to, to talk about, but I've tried to put a bit of a structure to it, which is a little bit <laughs> historical, um, I mean, again, by a way of introduction, you've done so much, um, you know, you've lectured at, you know, Ch Chelsea, Surrey, Kingston, Southampton, um, uh, uh, you know, some big names, they're doing all sorts of courses, the courses are diverse, the subjects are diverse and in depth, I mean, you've written over you know, I would think over 200 articles in various things you've produced. Uh, books, mon monographs, um, you've been on panels, you've written for the iconic magazines, uh, art magazines of the time, you've done all sorts of social sort of interventions, um, you know, an extraordinary career really, of diverse uh, intentions. Um, the other thing that I, I think needs to be recognised is your um, your dedication and resilience to certain ideas and um, passion for it, really. And I, I think that that is going to be evident in the in the work that we cover today, hopefully. But anyway, um, I'm going to well, before you before you go on, I'd just like to say that it's very generous of you, but I don't mean to be facetiously self-effacing, but I don't recognize any of that. Really? I just see myself as a bit of a screw up. <laughs> no, well, I, I, I don't think you need to feel that way. Um, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's a tough gig anyway, just yeah. in the art. So, you know, any sort of headway you can make um, with a focus for particular interests, I think is substantial. And, um, you know, well, that'll un that I think that will become evident to anybody that watches this. You know, um, the sort of nature of your career. I'm going to skip for the moment our current political yeah. world. Uh, that that will probably emerge later on, or probably I'm okay. going to yeah, aim to he end with that because I think with your experience and knowledge, that's certainly worth addressing. Mm -hmm. um, but going back. You know, I'm I'm thinking about you, but setting up your zines in the music business, and yeah, because that's oh, re-emerged as well. Your your interest in that in that sort of connection with music as well. Um, uh -huh. uh, was it white noise? Uh, no, zinc white noise. Zinc white noise is actually uh, something that I've uh, resurrected now. Um, but yeah, that goes back to a very early art punk scene. Yeah. So there you um, go. So that's 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 what I'm saying. So we was, start uh, with how did you get going with the zines and um, how did you find that? Well, I, I'm from a shitty little market town in Surrey. Okay. Um, we'll probably get to how I ended up on the far north coast in northwest Sutherland, mainland Scotland. But um, that shitty little market town in Surrey was an incredibly creative melting pot emerging from that were several no, i'm not going to name drop but several uh, respected actors 
all of my generation. Um, several bands which uh, I still look back on with fondness, but uh, made it quite big. Um, the most notable of those was uh, um, uh, Norman Cook and Paul, he Paul Heaton with the House, House Martins, and then Norman we know went on to other things. And um, yeah, it was just being like thrown into a crucible. I studied at Reigate School of Art Foundation, um, which I found out quite recently, actually Malcolm McLaren blagged a few months <laughs> at before he got thrown out. But that was before my time, thankfully. I'm not quite that old. Right. So, and you went from there to Chelsea? I went from there to Chelsea. Um, I actually had planned to go to St Martins, then I found out it was a bit shit. So uh, I switched to Chelsea. And um, yeah, I had a quite a good time at Chelsea. I think it was quite productive. Um, but I kind of bombed out in the third year. I, it was a bit of a weird one. I was talking about this to somebody recently um, who's now in New York City, who was there around the same time. And we both identified that there was a certain point in what I call Kings Road culture, where it all went a bit scaggy. And the th when we were in the third year, the a fir first year grouping came in and the, a drug scene developed within the sculpture department, which I was a part of. And um, my way of getting my shit together and moving beyond that was to actually take six months out to make a music documentary which aired in, in Japan and funded by Windsor and Newton. And that was about a Scottish painter who recently died called Alan Dick. And so we had, um, yeah, I came into contact with um, uh, bands of those times, New Order, Susie and the Banshees, who, who were the subjects of his paintings. And out of that came my involvement with Music for Miners, which was, I think, the first, it was um, before Red Wedge. So it was the first left um, music advocacy organisation, I think, that's what it's credited as anyway, um, in, in the UK, and that was during the miners' strike. We put on uh, New Order at um, the Royal Festival Hall, that was quite cool. Um, it was led by Don Coots, who's uh, quite a well-known TV um, uh, director. And um, yeah, again, another, another melting pot, if you like. It's, I, I kind of went off in that direction. But within a couple of weeks of leaving Chelsea, I, I just kind of blagged a few, a few writing gigs. Um, the first thing I ever published was in the face, um, which has now been resurrected. Everything's getting resurrected. We're all yeah. interviewing each other and resurrecting each other. It's yeah, quite good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um... So wasn't there a significant moment about you getting to write for modern painters? Yeah, there was. Um, and it's all a bit weird, really, now I look back on it. I, I just had a, a kitty. Um, well, I hadn't had a kitty because I can't have kiddies, but you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, with uh, a, a partner I was with at the time. And I just happened to write to Peter Fuller and say, did he fancy giving me a leg up? I, I was pretty fearless then, I'm a complete mess now, but I was, I was pretty fearless then. So I, I wrote to Peter and um, at his place in Stolentoft in Suffolk and said, um, you know, how do you get into this? I thought, well, you might as well aim up, yeah? And he said, come, come up next Sunday, and I did. And um, he tried me out on a couple of things, didn't like them. I think the first one was Anne Redfern, June Redfern, I can't remember. Um, and then my first piece for Modern Painters was on the Australian artist Peter Booth at the Auburn Mall Gallery. I don't really remember all this stuff it's so long ago. Yeah, but I mean, that, that was good. That, that was, that was, I don't know if you remember when Modern Painters hit. I can't remember when it was first, when it first appeared. I was in the second issue with that piece. And it just it just opened doors. It was it was weird. I remember anybody I got in touch with, all you had to do was say 
it's very strange looking back on it. All you had to do was say you you just written something for modern painters, and yeah, okay. Suddenly, I was writing for Apollo and all kinds of magazines, which I never thought. You know, I was a snotty kid just out of Chelsea. It's very well, weird. I mean, that, that, that's very that's weird. the amazing thing is that you did end up writing for all these iconic art magazines. I mean, modern painters for me as a, a, a painter was the publication at the time. I mean, it was so it, it was the only one dedicated to painting at a time when painting was start, you know, when we had sensation coming up, and, yeah. um, you know, it was starting to be questioned as a valid sort of medium. And modern painters was there sort of waving its flag going, hey, I'm the link, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, the, you've hit on something quite interesting there about the, the art business, if I can call it that. And I, it is a, I'm talking about the business rather than art. And, um, I remember shortly after that, I'd been doing a few things, mainly book reviews in the odd report from conferences for Art Monthly, um, when it was still run by Pete Townsend, or was it Margaret Garlake by then? I can't remember. But Patricia Bickers took over. And um, don't get me wrong, I've got admiration for what Patricia does. But uh, I called her up one day and I, I had a suggestion for a, a, a feature or possibly a long review on an artist um, who was working kind of in what we'd probably say is a post-conceptual way with painting at the time. I remember suggesting this, we had a chat about it on the telephone and then she said, the thing is Ian, Art Monthly doesn't really do painting anymore. <laughs> yeah. And that was one of those oh fuck moments. Yeah. Like what has happened? Peter had just died at that point and um, I just felt a shift taking place. And as you say, like sensation had happened and a few other things. I mean, a great inspiration for me, even though it was a complete failure of a show in many respects, was that massive thing that uh, Rosenthal and was it Sorota did, New Spirit in Painting at the Royal That's Academy. It. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, and I, another iconic exhibition. Yeah, was, absolutely. You know. um, and then suddenly it kind of flipped over and modern painters became like the, the, the bastard son of, um, I don't know, art and auction. And yeah. it, the business thing took over. And then we had the cult of celebrity, the artist, which I didn't give a fig about, frankly. I don't want to know what their lifestyle's about. I want to know about the work. Well, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's something I've had to face a lot um, in teaching about artists. I'll yeah. recall a, a, a tale some other time. Um, but I'm interested in the difference in culture. You sort of tapped on it there a little bit. The difference in culture between Art Monthly, Arts Review, Art Scribe, you know, they, these were all at the time con, sort of competing for different sectors of that art attention. And yeah. They they were, and I, I found that quite hard. I mean, for anybody starting out, trying because I, I was trying to pay the rent with, yeah. and raise a kid. I wasn't trying to, you know, I, I met a lot of people writing that time that had private income or they, they had another gig, which they were kind of did on the sly. Um, but I, I, was, I was writing for whoever would have art. I, I wrote for British Bike Magazine about, about painters like David Oxtoby, who painted British bikes in the 1960s did all sorts of stuff just because I had to um, and always felt I, I think this is an important point I've always felt on the other side of the window looking in and I quite like that position I don't I don't want it to seem like you know I'm not I don't feel important in any way whatsoever so I feel quite uncomfortable doing this in a, way, in, in a sense um, but uh, yeah I, I'm not sure where I was going with that but um, well, the in, difference in, in, in sort of cultures of these different magazines. Um, yeah, I, I spotted a trick, and I don't mean this in a negative or weird way, but um, in a strange way, I, I, I don't know. I, I went east, so I went to Eastern Europe. At yeah. a point when the, well, the Berlin Wall was just coming down, I was first out in Poland before it did, and, and what was then Czechoslovakia. And there was all this amazing stuff going on. Um, and it quickly, uh, it quickly kind of collapsed and the Western art market was exported. I can remember um, Agnes Husslein of Sotheby's 
um, introducing symposia in Czechoslovakia and Hungary um, about westernizing the Eastern art market. And what that actually meant in real terms very quickly was you'd have art galleries selling art, but they'd have racks of porn in there as well. It was very, very strange. Yeah. And I'm not talking about, you know, um, Czech photographer like Jan, Jan Saudek. Um, who I interviewed, but um, and he's seen sometimes as quite pornographic, misogynistic uh, photographer. Um, but I'm, I'm talking about bog standard porn in right. magazine mags alongside the art mags, and it just the whole thing was going very weird. I, I can't, I still can't. No, now I look back, I, I still haven't really made sense of it. I just right. found that we can't were rationalize. Yeah, it, it's just strange. So your involvement with the I mean, because they are at the core of the art world at the time. Um, mm -hmm. It must have given you quite an insight into the business of it. And I just wondered, yeah. you're, having come from an art school, gone into these uh, magazines that are reporting on it, criticising it, introducing you to different, and as you say, opening doors, what was mm -hmm. your first impression of the art business? That it was ailing, it was ailing. There were there were maladies that bit on display, which I didn't like. They had that right. re that gangrenous reek, and um, I did have a problem with that. I wrote quite a lot about that. At okay, that time. so do you think? I mean, because the the art business is considered. I mean, that people react against it quite often as being toxic it's too commercial it's manipulated it's insider it's elitist all of these things do you think mm -hmm. it's a necessary evil or do you think there's a better way of doing it i think there's always a better way of doing it it's just not the will um and it doesn't make good copy from in the opinion of many um you know there's people that i respect um you know, I respect Matthew Collins for what he does. Um, Valdemar, I, it's, I respect him for what he, I particularly respect him for what he does. It's, it's good TV. Um, and a lot of the stuff that um, Valdemar wrote for The Guardian when he was critic there. Um, and there's a story behind this. Um, but um, that, that was good art criticism. He was reviewing shows such as um, one that really sticks in my mind is uh, and always has was his review of the uh, tradition and renewal about um, East, Euro East European painting, which was at the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford. That was a stonking review and it really stirred things up for a lot of people, I think. Um, I, mean, I actually approached uh, him to see if I could get a gig with the Guardian and he had the audacity to tell me that I sounded like Peter Fuller on the phone. <laughs> um, I thought that was just my polite voice but um, <laughs> I, had that, I had that kind of drawl and um, he just laughed at me for about five minutes and we didn't talk about me right for the Guardian right. at all but I, I wasn't trying to get in there I, I just like I say I was just playing the field and it's a bit of a tart. Yeah sure but I mean do you do you still hold that view about the art world and do you think it is corrupt or do you think it is something that operates in its own world and doesn't affect the sort of general it's difficult because i'm i'm now on the north coast of scotland and it operates very differently up here um and i left a lot of that behind yeah i actually decided to pack it in because i'd had enough yeah um and it felt like a, a young person's game suddenly. And when I say young pe person's game, I mean those just recent graduates writing. Yeah. Um, and um, I didn't have the energy to, to keep, and this sounds very arrogant, I don't mean it this way, but keep trying to pitch articles to editors as a freelance um, and feel like, they weren't getting it and you know that may that may fall upon the fact that i wasn't conveying it right but i don't think that it's so corrupt i, I don't know I, i'm kind of a bit out of touch with how it is in your part of the world and i think there is quite a gulf <laughs> well i i, I know that we're in the same it, united kingdom. Not my world. Yeah. um 
so on the corollary of that is the government funding side of it, the subsidised side of it. How do yeah, you I think that? I think David Lee has got it right with the jackdaw. I don't know if you take the jackdaw, but um, I I used to yeah. before, but yeah, I mean it's become a bit of a kind of like grumpy old men's kind of thing in a yeah. way. But he he does it he does it fairly well, and I think that sometimes he's spot on. He's ahead of the game on that um, with the whole state sponsored art. But then in a way, that's kind of the arse end of what Peter Fuller was doing with his um, he, he coined a term for it, didn't he? Um, Bicca B I C C A, which was uh, Biennale International Club Class Art. Right. And I think the first time I went to the Venice Biennale, I, I yeah, just on the, uh, what do they call them, the travelators, whatever, the yeah. um, horizontal, uh, just the chatter, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I didn't enjoy it. Didn't feel I fitted in, didn't want to fit in. Okay. So having been a journalist and a critic, yeah. and a, a writer, do you, did you see yourself as a, all of those, a critic, a writer, historian. I mean, how did you go about? It, I used to, it depended who I was talking to, but it was arts writer, um, freelance journalist. Um, I mean, I was doing other stuff. I was writing for, uh, I was providing, never got much of a byline, um, writing for, um, copy for Private Eye. Um, yeah. A few, a few sort of current affairs type stuff as well, not necessarily connected with the arts, but kind of like fringe culture kind of stuff, um, which again got a bit kind of crazy at times. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you took, you're talking about cultural corruption, uh, you, you use the word corrupt, you're talking about cultural corruption rather than the art business itself, I think. I mean, uh, well, don't get me wrong, you know, I don't, I don't. I, I, I met a lot of David Coombs at the Antique Collector, which was actually a closet copy of um, Apollo, or so it became, in a yeah. way. It was a really good magazine. He's one of the best editors I've ever worked for. Um, he had a, it was a very small team. He had an arts editor that, that never overextended himself with design. He had a, a lovely um, sub-editor that always made my copy more interesting than anything I'd actually written. And um, he had a features editor who was Brett Gorvey, who you probably know from his galleries, yeah. um, uh, who was initially headhunted by Christie's and then, then took off on his own in the commercial sector. Right. And they were, they were good people. There was a lot of good people around as well. You know, I, and the first gig I had for them, um, I thought I was going to be writing about contemporary art and they said, no, we want you to write about um, 17th century Italian silverware because we want a new angle on it. And yeah, it's enjoyable. It was a surprise. And uh, now uh, of that, I got interviews with Alan Bon Bonus and various people that uh, I look back on with fondness. Yeah. So you, you then went to teach journalism. Yeah, I did. There'd been a, a Southampton, they'd set up a, um, a journalism course, um, journalism and public relations, and it had two kind of pathways that students could follow. And um, one was he heavily ethically based, and um, one definitely wasn't. And I'll let you guess which was which. <laughs> um, but uh, um, that, well, that was fun. It was in a university that was very keen on widening participation. And um, I'm quite interested in the social justice aspect of that. Um, so we're getting a lot of students who were first generation going and doing a degree. Um, and that is something which, uh, I mean, in a way that, that if you're looking for a theme that ties all this together, that, that would be it, social justice. Um, though I tend to try and play that though I have tried to play that down sometimes um, whether I was in Eastern Europe um, writing about somebody working in in a studio in a mausoleum in the Jewish cemetery in Prague or wherever um, or um, uh, teaching journalism to students that didn't really know why they were there but they were prepared to have their mind changed yeah yeah so um, how do you feel about academic institutions and, and why did you give it up there's a limit to what i can say about that and that's why i haven't named the university we just know where it is um but i signed a non-disclosure agreement in order that i could get out financially intact 
Yeah. Um, what I can say is part of the public, because uh, it's part of the public record, it's out there, is that um, a lot of people of my generation had a pretty bad time. In fact, I had one colleague that took him off to the nearby New Forest and hanged himself. Um, it was pretty serious. It was getting bad. It was around the time that uh, universities were introducing associate lecturers or hourly paid. And, uh, you know, if you're earning just shy of 50 grand as a senior lecturer, as I was, um, privileged though I felt to have that money, it's, I, I found that it was it was not worth the candle. It was quite okay. serious. Quite yeah, serious. So, I'm quite passionate about that. OK, well, what do you think about the education but bit of it i mean i understand the environment as a lecturer because that's i mean that's how do you feel about the lecturers going on strike now i don't know why they're lecturing but do you are you aware of this and do you feel sympathy for their circumstances oh, man, i i'm not even aware that anybody was on strike is, is that, that oh yeah art colleges art, yeah. Is, uh, con, con, well not only art colleges i mean uh, my daughters have both suffered for education from lecturers going on strike and some i think yeah. are justified and others i think you know yeah doing um but um well all i can say about that i guess is that yeah i, I was on strike um while i was a lecturer and yeah. um i found that it did very little to change the culture um i found that it put a target on a lot of people's backs and many of them were gone within four or five years Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if I don't follow that development as much as I should, I think, in all honesty, and I'm, I'm being quite open with you, I think I'm pretty scarred by it still. Yeah. 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 I mean, I imagine. having said that, I did it for 25 years. <laughs> well, that, that's what, yeah. so that's why I'm interested in your thoughts about academia from having been at Chelsea, having lectured mm -hmm. at these, all these other places. Um, how do you feel about the, the quality of it and the sort of culture of it now? I'm not sure. I, uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure I have any feelings about it at all. Um, other than I don't think that our students are being served as well as they should be. And probably something that put a target on my back was, I, I, you know, I, was developing um, materials all the time to um, in a variety of subject areas. But um, actually, one of the first questions I would ask students is, or not necessarily the first question, but it would usually crop up. So, so why have you taken out a loan to do this? Yeah, um, and that's part. That's something to do with our generation. I think. I mean, when I graduated from Chelsea, it was it was. I just got out before it became the London Institute, um, which was a very strange time, the merger of the London schools in some yeah. way. Um, I don't know all the political in, uh, in, uh, intricacies of that. I don't remember. Um, but I, I know that things were going downhill pretty quickly. And I think that uh, what Chelsea provided me, which a lot of art schools don't, was a good, solid, level-headed, humanities education yeah um i you know i i have talked to a lot of um, graduates or we have to call them emerging artists though i don't know what they're emerging from that's that's a very difficult term um and uh of, of late and um a lot of them seem to be guided to finding an issue with which they can identify and going with that in the first year of their education, um, whether it be environmental issues or gender issues or wh whatever it may be. And yeah, I mean, I, the reason I chose to go to art school was because you've got a space to just splash around a bit yeah. with your work and not think too hard about it. Yeah, think hard about it, but not, not overanalyze that, that, that first developmental freedom. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not um, sure if I'm being that helpful there. Well, I mean, I, I, it's, I I'm, I'm gonna throw it back at you though, in so much of finding an issue, because I'm gonna raise three sort of controversies. One is the undercover work you did with the Green Party reporting. 
Oh uh, God, you have been doing your homework. <laughs> uh, and yeah. how did that come about? Um, I was, uh, oh, where was I? Um, I think I got involved with um, the arts policy. I, I, yeah, that's the, right. I, yeah. yeah, the arts policy working group of the Green Party. Now, we should first of all say that I'm talking about a Green Party, which is not the Green Party of today. This was a Green Party which enjoyed no power and was still working itself out. Yeah. Um, but uh, the Arts Policy Working Group was actually, um, you probably, if you've read about this, you, you probably know more about it than I can remember. But um, they were very much um, led by some key figures. I'm not going to name any of them. But they were looking at the devolution of the arts, not to the uh, regional level, not to the county level, not to, they were taking it down to the parish level. And I can remember phrases in policy working documents, which I was getting hold of and photocopying and distributing to people that shouldn't really have had them. Um, and eventually published on this in Art Monthly, um, had a page two piece where I went ahead with that, um, which was um, it's kind of fringe new right was yeah. coming through within the Green right. Party at that time. I mean, I think they sorted their, their stuff out, but um, it was, uh, you know, phrases such as if a renaissance is going to happen in the arts, it's going to happen at the parish level, right. and not at the regional level. Um, we, uh, Marinetti and destroy, we will destroy museums and so on, I can't quote it verbatim, um, was uh, very much in the, in the policy documents at that time. Um, uh, closure of the uh, Royal Opera House, um, which however you feel about that, I think there's a place for centres of excellence. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, return of all art artefacts um, to their native countries from the British Museum. Yeah, yeah, maybe we can agree with that. But there's a lot of other stuff in there as well, which I've conveniently forgotten. Um, well, that's uh, fine. I just I, I thought it was an interesting because of, again, the environmental concerns. It was, as you say, it was early days. And yeah. uh, the fact that they were, I mean, now they, they would have had to have considered that in a far more depth and, and oh, far broader sort of terms. So it's just interesting as part of their history, um, which then leads me to the Journal of Geography and Urban Research. How did that come about? Um, honestly, um, do you want to go there? Um, well, I mean, again, I had... because I, I think it then relates to certain next day stages of your life in, in many ways. Yeah, I mean, I was in, it's, it's kind of, I can talk about it now because I'm not an academic anymore, but I, I've been going out a lot and clubbing quite a bit um, and spending a lot of time walking around the urban environment pretty dazed and confused to use that cliche and um, became interested in how people drift in the city and how we are um, maneuvered by corporate capitalism um, right through to you know, bog standard street signage and, and the breaking of the rules um, in how to navigate the city interests me quite a lot. Psychogeography was quite cool at that point. I got into a lot of hot water with people for academicizing it in some way because I'd written a couple of books on it and right. uh, had a website and as you say the journal I got interviewed by the Guardian about it and it all got very hot and, and um, under my well, why really. why do you think it got so hot well because actually psychogeography was very much uh, um, the uh, property or the it, its uh, provenance um, goes back to French radicals and the situationists before then. Uh, yeah, Trist. Yeah. And oh, um, yeah, I'm, of course, we're talking about a period of this would have coincided around the time of the poll tax riots and so on. And um, there was a whole counterculture there that had felt that the psychogeography was theirs. And that, that's fair enough. Um, okay. I was trying to do something else with it, um, as were a lot of people. I, w I wasn't involved with the um, uh, the Ian Sinclair end of it or the more radical end. I was trying to do something a bit more. Yeah, well, it's a bit different. Well, I mean, it's it certainly persisted that that um, interest. Yeah, it's almost becoming cool again. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, 
yeah, it's dominating quite a, a bit of thinking. Um, so, and, and so then the third uh, one, the controversy, was the, the Venice Biennale. And I believe you were critical, I don't know this context <laughs> of this at all, of artist yeah. networks, curator networks. Yeah. Uh, God, where are you getting this stuff from? Oh, um, here, there, everywhere, yeah. you know. No, I mean, okay. just for... I think that, that was something that was organised by Wimbledon, I think Edinburgh University or College of Art, Edinburgh College of Art had something to do with it as well, I, they're the organisers, but I, yeah, I ended up, I got a phone call one day, said um, it was an uh, editor of mine um, at the art newspaper, um, Artline International, I think they put the international on when Artscribe went international as well, but Artline magazine, he, he called me up and said, uh, um, they want some, these guys want somebody to go to Venice and talk about the economies of gossip in the art world. And I'd just written something for him about it. So he put me forward and within a week I was on a plane sitting next to Ricky DeMarco, uh, Sasha Craddock, right. um, Gavin, somebody or other who, um, yeah, was a bit antagonistic to what I said. And I think my overall argument if I was to try to sum it up, is we're staring into a deep, dark hole here with the economies of gossip. And yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd curated a few shows, quite a few shows at this point. And there was, I'd encountered artists, for example, that were basically setting up shop on the corner and waiting for the phone to ring, um, largely around Hoxton. Um, it was before Hoxton was developed in the way it became. Um, and of course, I'm old enough to know about Black Friday and the collapse of the, uh, um, the, the art market and just about everything else, um, yeah. our financial institutions. And I, I, at the point that I was doing that, the panel in, um, at the Biennale and um, writing the things that I was, I was remembering a time when Mark Glazebrook, um, critiquing eventually a um, highly respected gallery um, dealer, I believe, um, he one day asked me to go around some of the, uh, to value some art in uh, the Wapping Flats. And um, the art was still on the walls, but the Porsches had gone from the underground garage when they all cleared out. And I found that really shocking. And what filled the void is a little bit like plumbers to tell you, however you try to keep water out, they'll always find a way in. And in there came the artist curator. Yeah. I'll curate you into mine if I'll curate it, you know, scratch your back, scratch mine kind of thing. And there was a lot of fake curation going on. And I don't know, just got a bit antagonistic about it really and thought to myself that maybe it was a subject to approach. And that coincided with, as I say, me curating a couple of exhibitions in particular where artists were renaming the name of works because the exhibitions were actually, there was one exhibition in particular, it was called The Beautiful South. I don't know why it was called that. That wasn't my title. <laughs> that would appeal to It was supposed to be paint, <laughs> painting on the South Coast. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not going full circle there, but we could have done. Um, and um, yeah, there was one artist in particular and he became the focus of my attention in the thing I delivered in Venice, which was, um, he, he had renamed paintings of the Icelandic coastline, co, uh, coastline um, and given them South Coast England titles so that he would qualify for getting into that exhibition. Now, Mel Gooding took me to task about this, um, rest, rest in peace Mel, but he, he took, took me to task about this um, shortly after I got back from Venice and, and he said, why are you going after the little guys? And again, to extend the plumbing analogy, just because Dynarod's getting it wrong and they got plenty of cash, it doesn't mean that you don't actually expose some of the guys with a white van. And was there any mileage in that? I don't know. Um, I do feel bad about it in a way, but um, because some people did actually stop painting and I... But was it concern for values though? Yeah, it was. It was well. It was a concern for authority, authenticity, yeah, and audience. And those words, they all share the same root for a very good reason. 
the audience expects authenticity and to have authenticity you have to speak from a position of authority yeah. you have to know what you're doing and you have to have some ethical background yeah now i got taken to task and go oh, i can't remember his name now but the, another guy on the panel took me to me to task about it and um said that i was being incredibly moralizing a little bit like gordon brown who was then prime minister and um I didn't see that at all. I didn't think it was moralizing. It was an ethical issue. Um, there was a lot of scammers. I mean, you can probably remember, not that we need to sort of go into it in any de any further depth, but there's a lot of scammers at the time. Um, uh, what, and they would set themselves up as authorities without any authority. If I can name one, do you want me to? It sure. would be... Harry Pye, who yeah. at that time I think was working in, in the Tate Gallery and was um, on his MySpace website, remember them? Yeah. Um, his profile read, I have probably told more curators and artists what to hang than any other person. And I didn't see that as really worthy credentials. Yeah. Doesn't, and that does come into the economies of gossip theme in a way. Like, yeah okay so now we live in this culture i mean meanwhile i was you know ricky demarco and sasha Craddock were talking about big brother and so on and how how the economies of gossip from reality tv had infected the art market but I, I was going going in a little bit more level probably so low that i was in the gutter yeah yeah um and then came a very big move for you to setting up in the new forest with Boo Dyer. Yeah. Your food lab, art food lab. Yeah, that's true. Um, I thought, look, yeah, I mean, you and I, I think we we're in, connected on social media at that point. So yeah. I think you saw it gradually getting rolled out where I yeah. kind of packed up writing around art altogether and um, started growing food. Um, we were 85, percent self-sufficient in a rather ingenious system which we got going i've just written about this recently actually for a new magazine coming out called documents which right. is um more academic end of arts writing um again set up by the guy that mike von joel who um gave me the tip off about the panel in venice and um yeah of course joseph boys is a big uh, he's an artist who I greatly admire. Um, there's a lot of debate, I know. I've seen it aired uh, about, you know, everybody is an artist and so on. But um, I'm not so interested in that. I'm interested in the fact that he was one of the first male TV chefs in Germany. Things like that. Is um, that right? Yeah. I did. Yeah. Know. How, how, so how did that, I mean, do you know more about that? Yeah, I mean, well, you'll know that whenever he did, a, um, I mean, those documenta events that he did um, and um, uh, up in Edinburgh um, and in various places throughout Italy, it always became important to Boyce that he would share a meal with those involved in the event, whether yeah. they were the punters, yeah, yeah. so to speak, yeah. um, or those that were involved, uh, involved in the events organisation and events management. And um, the meal was very important, and it is to human culture the breaking of bread. I mean, I don't want to get all wussy about it, you know what I mean? But it's no, I, uh, I, I agree with you. It's, it's essential. I mean, in a way, that's where some of our best private views have come from. You know, get together for a, for a, something to eat and look yeah. at the art. Yeah. yeah. So and sit down meals. Yeah, in yeah. the gallery, yeah. and that's what boys did. And um, in, in a way, I was looking at uh, whether we could uh, actually do something, which is, again, connects with uh, social exclusion and social justice, whether we could actually get, get going in a sink estate in Southampton, um, something which might be taken up by the local uh, residents. It didn't happen. There was reasons. So, I mean, it, it, was, it was very much a situationist action. It yeah. was very utility. And I think my favourite quote of yours from that time is, if I can get it right, it fed us more plentifully than object-based art ever had. 
I thought. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it was damn good fun and it felt more art than art was right. it, the, the art that I was being art, had been asked to write about at that time. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it was a yeah. tough environment, wasn't it? What was? Where, you know, that's a state that you were... Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you remember, because I was posting videos of yeah. um, for, out of the front window of our, our semi-detached house where kids are actually, you know, you got five or six kids. They would trash a car in a day. It would be in pieces in a day. Yeah. Um, that uh, had been stolen. And, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why they were doing that. I'm not talking about antisocial behaviour. I'm, you know, the house next door that we we're attached to was actually a bit... Uh, uh, rented out as part of a witness protection scheme so you're talking about incredibly disadvantaged people yeah. being and their their kids being introduced to that environment and then in the back garden we had about um, i'll give boo credit for this because she became very involved in the poultry aspect but we had uh, about 40 or 50 quail yeah and um a lot of uh chickens both meat and egg birds um and yeah, as I say, we took on an allotment as well. I'm rather overextended ourselves and fell flat on our face, but it did provide about 80%, 85% self sufficiency. Yeah. And, and it, it looked beautiful. <laughs> you know, it looked in, in a real contrast to its surroundings. And it, it was, I could see this yeah. or feel, I could feel this sort of beacon of, of uh, light that you were trying to shine into this place through the work that you both put in um but it eventually got the better of you didn't it yeah it did it killed us uh, you know that as soon as you introduce in an urban environment near a general hospital a lot of foodstuffs the first thing you're going to find is rats and they got in to the house they got into everywhere right and we were fighting pests a lot because of course the other thing you're doing when you're growing a, a lot of uh, vegetables in the middle of what effectively is an urban desert yeah um you become a pest magnet so if everybody was doing it there'd be more plants to go around and the, you yeah know, i saw i saw a, a planting of horseradish that we had which we'd worked hard to grow over a couple of years get stripped in two days by caterpillars right absolutely there's just sticks yeah and um yeah i mean things like that were it just yeah destroyed us in a way and how were you perceived by the locals nuts complete nuts well the, did you did i mean they, don't, don't forget we had a van we, away we, because you were nuts or um there was a little christian group that quite liked the idea of um getting something similar going and that was all about their raising of social capital which was quite exclusionary and I didn't like um, because, you know, effectively it became a, their version becomes like a gated community where unless you're in the club, yeah, you don't get to participate where we were trying to do something else. Um, but uh, sorry, I can't remember your question. Very rude. Which was, no, 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 it's, it's fine. Uh, there's a lot going through your head. So uh, it was just about how, whether they engaged with you because they thought you were a curiosity or whether they stayed away from you because they thought you were mad you know i mean well before we started it I, I used to get quite a lot of threats i mean i got beaten up a couple of times on that estate um it was pretty heavy and but once we started going at it full pelt I and mean, bear in mind we used to have a van and we'd rock up with all sorts of stuff that we'd find like we we got very good we got very good at skinning roadkill deer um butchering roadkill deer and uh, so we'd rock up with a deer, a Belfast sink. I'm just giving you an example of what we came home with one day. Yeah. A Belfast sink, a beam of a beech tree, and um, a rather good laser printer that we found. And it kind of outpegged anything that the car wreckers and vandals were actually doing. They didn't know what to make of it. Yeah. It was kind of, I don't know, I wouldn't say they're frightened of us, they're just like, what's all that about? Yeah, and you weren't intimidated by them? Not as much once we started doing that. Yeah. Because nobody got it. Yeah. And um, I suppose we became a bit of a gated community in a way. It's, you know, it's all very well me saying that about others, but we did. But uh, So then you got involved with the gypsies and the ponies 
in the new forest? The estate that we were living in was uh, an estate which um, had been built to house the gypsies that had been on the new forest land since the uh, uh, the Tudor period, late Tudor period. And, um, you know, it's extraordinary heritage there. In fact, the artist Augustus John, World Academician, was uh, the Gypsy Law president at that point. And um, he wrote something in a, in a book which um, called Wanderers in the New Forest. And um, he wrote the preface to that in which he said um, something, again, I can't quote him verbatim, but, you know, the, the gypsies were forced into compounds by the Forestry Commission. They were hosed off the line by Hampshire Fire Brigade. Um, it was a very low level, and we have to use this term delicately, but it was a, it was a low level ethnic cleansing yeah. of somewhere which then became eventually a national park, but that couldn't have happened without the cleansing of those individuals and those people. And where were they put? They were put in the satellite sink estates of Southampton. And so my argument very much was in the book, which I um, wrote called The Gated Community, uh, The New Forest, A Gated Community yeah. of the Mind, um, was that uh, actually the forest now extends beyond what used to be the forest traditional back to 1066, William the Conqueror and so on, it it's very much extends beyond those boundaries and includes the satellite estates. I mean, we used to have the great, great, great grandchildren of those people that host, host off the land in the Victorian period, and uh, not host off, but sent off the land in the Victorian period. I mean, their, their offspring and their, their um, uh, um, their, their, their kids and were still riding ponies up and down our street. Yeah. Um, there were people that kept ponies and it's not necessarily good husbandry, but there was a lot of fly grazing until they, the government stopped that. But we used to have people that kept ponies in the garden. Yeah. And there's quite, so, you know, that, that quite a range of them. Alive. No, there is still better. quite a range, isn't there? Yeah. Urban, yeah. urban ponies and urban horse, right, you know. Yeah. Uh, they're riding bareback as well, like traditional sort yeah. of, you know, yeah. I've seen it in Limerick, I've seen it in various Irish towns, um, because I'm of part Irish, part Scottish heritage. Yeah. So you wouldn't know it. Um, yeah. Hmm. And um, as you may be aware, um, I was involved with the tree charter. And I wasn't aware of that. I'm sorry. I, I, I oh, no, yeah. Oh, well, I was involved with the tree charter. I was uh, engaged with okay. them. And um, I saw you've written about the rights to the forest and obviously with the concern of the gypsies. And it, I was yeah. very uh, struck at how um, anaesthetised the power of the tree charter was uh, presented, how, how, how all of that was sanitised and de yeah. it, the power of it was sort of dissipated. And um, I thought that was extraordinary since it was such a fundamental right. So when you talk about these people being moved off, um, yeah. the whole common land aspect of the tree charter um, yeah. and seeing how that all operated was quite a, an eye opener to me. <laughs> um, yeah. and it's that, that that's quite interesting because those people that we're talking about here, and say those people, the the, the Romani Neviwesh, um, who were the people of the New Forest, uh, you know, yeah, they yeah. trod lightly upon the land. Yeah. They're indigenous yeah. people in the sense that trod lightly upon the land only when they were forced into compounds. Bearing in mind, this is like just after the Second World War and they were forced to wear badges on their coats um, to identify them, forced into compounds, which as I say, Augustus John actually identified, he mentioned, he uses the words concentration camps. Um, but again, we have to use that, that phrase delicately um, today. Uh, you know, it was only, only then when they were forced into the camps that they, they actually were living in quagmire situations. And um, that's incredibly worrying. It's worrying particularly that at the time, by the time it became a national park, um, houses that had once been quite cheap 
for locals, relatively cheap for locals, um, because you're a quick hop and commute to London from there. Um, I think there was something like 65% higher house prices than anywhere else in the UK. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, what I was dealing with there, I mean, I'm kind of overplaying it in a way, but it was, was social engineering. And yeah. Social engineering, pure and simple. Yeah, that's fine. For profit. Um, so that you had various um, personal problems and difficulties to face when you were still down there. Mm -hmm. um, very sort of poignantly with your son. Um, yeah, my, my son um, was, uh, he had muscular dystrophy, my, my uh, youngest son, he had muscular yeah. dystrophy, so yeah, he's, he was on quite a short timeline, yeah. Yeah, and that must have been extremely affecting, but then it, it um, seemed, uh, was it not long after that, that you then decided to move to Tongue? How, how much well actually what yeah the wind blew us to tongue but um actually the original goal was to uh be slightly further along the uh the north coast here um yeah. but you know you, you stay where you stay and um but that's no quite a shift coast to coast to, coast, down to the wilds of north scotland yeah yeah Isn't it? absolutely um, big culture shock. Um, the idea was not to, we, we were growers. We were leaving Southampton as growers. We were moving to the North Coast and we bought a place blind, um, which should never be, never recommended. Um, but uh, our hand was forced. We had a buyer for a rat infested house in Southampton. And what are you going to do if suddenly the place that we were going to buy um, we found out, I think it's illegal to sell them, but it was landlocked, couldn't get to it, we had right. no access track, yeah. it would be ours. So we ended up buying somewhere blind, got a friend to look at it, and they thought it was great, but they didn't look at it as growers. So when we got there, it was like, ah, hang on, there's no soil, you go down three inches and it's rock, didn't right. do our homework. So yeah, Phil, it still rankles, it was the most naive thing I've ever done, probably, <laughs> maybe not, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been mortgage free in Southampton, and suddenly it was like, and I thought it was going to be mortgage free here, and suddenly yeah. we had a huge millstone around our neck and had to rip this place down and rebuild it. Nice little well, I cottage. Think, um, you know, this is one of the contradictions with you. You know, is that you're you're very urban in your sort of appreciations in many ways, and then you have this capacity for being extremely rural and skillful in a rural environment. And again, see the same monumental task that you took on in Southampton, you took on with this building in the north of Scotland. Uh, you completely transformed the place through all sorts yeah. of weathers, the difficulty. Until we run out of money. Why? Uh, resources. I mean, again, what? And, you know, most, a lot of it yourselves. Well, what you. What you're kind of not connecting up there, maybe, for all good reasons I understand, is that I'd seen how it was done in other countries. So I'd been in the Balkans, I'd been in Eastern Europe. I'd, I'd always had an interest in transient communities and communities in places of conflict and spent a lot of time in those. Yeah. Um, and I could see that there's some things that should not be a dissuasion to at least trying. If the sappers can build a school in, in Bosnia in a day, then we can transform a house in a year, a yeah. cottage in a year. Um, didn't happen because we're not the sappers. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was my thinking anyway, as I say, naive. Well, I mean, uh, I, I I'm not saying I don't feel capable, but yeah, <laughs> I cannot, I can't overdo it. Yeah, well, again, the energy levels required and the commitment required. Again, I, I can only help you know, salute you for it because, uh, Pete, I I don't want to be kind of dare I say, if I may say, wanky about it, but actually, I I've always seen it as kind of some form of personal performance art not necessarily for an audience no but you know it's 
that moment, that magic moment of transformation just fascinates me, whatever, sure. whatever it is. I also think there's, a, um, as I read it, as a life statement, there's a statement of living in it that you are, are observing and then endorsing. Uh, and it's, there's a, there is a rejection of certain values in it. Yeah, I mean, bear in mind as well that we, we've moved up here at the arse end of the EU referendum. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, back into Europe. Nic Nicola Sturgeon issued Europe. the call and we arrived. Yeah. <laughs> And then look what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was, I, I did see, I mean, connecting it back just very briefly, I did see a direct connection with the polarization of British society, particularly English society, and uh, the social exclusion of a huge swathes of the population yeah. um, under Cameron and Osborne and austerity Britain. Yeah. yeah. So how have you found it? In Scotland? Yeah. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, it I certainly looks it. I love it on many levels. Um, there are challenges, um, not least with um, some of the challenges of keeping a quarterly arts publication going up here, which um, I don't know if you want to talk about, but that was, that was kind of uh, the biggest challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So the setting up of art north how, how, what was the motivation for that well having just lost a cottage i'm wondering what the hell i was going to do in and bear in mind that whilst we we're doing that cottage art we were living in uh, the estate agent very uh, fondly referred to it as a bothy but actually it was an animal shed which came with the cottage and we ended <laughs> up living in that for eight months without any water it was about 10 by 15 inside yeah um, it was medieval that was infested by rats as well and it did get to the point I don't, know, I don't want to tell a tale of woe really and I'm not going for the sympathy vote but I I, I became quite ill um, I think we both did and um, it well, that's what I mean point, well it, I mean I was it? quite heavy when I moved up here I was about 14 stone and I dropped a nine stone in three months oh, God, yeah yeah, I mean, it's pretty scary. I, and I became quite psychologically fragile as well with that, yeah. the, that situation. Um, and um, I've had always had a thing, I don't know why I've put myself in difficult situations because I do have a bit of an anxiety issue um, and it's always followed me through life. So, but it's never been a dissuasion to not try. No. Um, and so, yeah, then to answer your question, I, what am I going to do with my time? Um, is this really the wind's blown us this way? It's a beautiful little village. Um, I think it's about a population of about 500, but some of it dispersed quite widely. And um, I noticed that there was one thing that seemed to be absent, and that was an art magazine serving Northern Scotland. Much of which is, you know, bear in mind the Highlands are um, roughly the size of Belgium. And no art magazine, plenty of artists, maybe that was needed. Um, it was intended to start quite small, but it, it was in a way a victim of its own success. So in readers were very kindly sort of posting on mass images of them holding up their copy when they received the first copy and getting lovely emails from people saying, you know, this feels like ours. We haven't. Uh, to my knowledge, it hadn't been done before, a quarterly cost glossy for the Northern Highlands of Scotland, but in connecting, the idea was to connect the artists of the North with territories which belong to ancient trade routes. So, you know, there was things in common that I detected very quickly in coming up here that I also detected as themes in art in Norway, Sweden, Finland, um, Iceland, Greenland, the Canadian maritime provinces of uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, Newfoundland, uh, Nova Scotia, where the Scottish diaspora is obviously quite strong. Um, but very quickly, the magazine picked up readers all over the place, you know, as far afield as Tasmania, for God's sake, it's called Art North and it's being yeah. sold to subscribers in Tasmania. Um, 
I'm not saying that I got that right in any way. I was a very poor editor. Uh, Michael Pepia, who uh, edited art, uh, published Art International for a while, and wrote his memoir in um, about it's titled um, Francis Bacon in in the Blood, a memoir. Um, he talks about running and publishing an art magazine, and um, that actually it just becomes a money pit. It really yeah. does. Well, I mean. Um, this this was, yeah, this was one of my thoughts is that, you know, we've got the, the Internet coming. I mean, most print publications have struggled with overheads, you know, and um, the, the production costs and uh, just the sheer amount of time it takes to compile the, this thing. I mean, the, the, the photographs that are beautiful, you know, there's extensive text from all sorts of things. It's beautifully put together. I mean, just I'm going to put, hold these up for the sake of. Uh, you know, just for the record, really, because, um, yep. you know, we've got some fantastic, and some of them are extensive, and you've got double editions with, you know... Double the, editions were done during COVID. Right, um, yeah. Because we're also still, running an online gallery. Working, um, and they are diverse. Now, I'm just going to read you uh, your own words back at you, actually, because... Oh, God. Yeah, here we go. Don't do uh, that. You're quoting... You're quoting have have you ironed out the typos? <laughs> <laughs> for, my, for my part, I've highlighted what I see as some key points of note, whether they relate, relate to my thinking on the micro moments of high modernism that we may still detect in our midst, or in our re-evaluation of past moments from art history that might reveal fresh insights. Am I correct this time to look again for the sublime in art, for example, or is that term now lost its meaning altogether? I'm going to skip a little bit. With no progressive yeah. path, this is uh, perhaps I ought to say it's this Philip Bram, Bram. Um, um, yeah. with no progressive path forward, many artists put their work to useful causes, socio-political critique, environmental activism, sexual and gender politics, ethnic and minority ad advocacy, urban regeneration. Some spurn critical theory altogether, turning to social media platforms that provide instant gratification for their productions. Others prefer to play in the ruins of modernism parodying, satirizing, ironicizing. His list goes on, but the proof enough that there are surely complex times indeed. And just to finish, mm -hmm. whatever your own view, I have mine. The better we can communicate now about not just our art, but our environmental interventions occurring at a local, national and international level, the greater chance we have of recognizing our commonality of experience in the North. If we do not, then that way lies the road to obscurity. How does that sit now with a little reflection? You're quite smart because what you've done is um, you've reminded me of something. I need to come back to the Philip Brown piece actually in a second, just briefly. But um, you've reminded me that there is a longevity of interest and a linear path that I've been following. And well, frankly, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I could have paid for a lot of therapy to find that out, but um, yeah, I mean, reflecting back on what we've been talking about, that's, that's quite a smart observation. Um, I should say about the Philip Brown um, article on the sublime in art, that um, my introduction there, um, which you first read and then Phil's piece. Yeah. I, as an editor, I absolutely mullered his piece <laughs> without his permission. I and it, he he was gracious enough to understand that what I was trying to do. I, th I think he was great. He was gracious enough. I don't know whether I got across the understanding that uh, what I was trying to do. And this was a problem with Art North altogether. I was trying to be all things to all people. And you know, Phil teaches um, philosophy, and uh, um, yeah, I did cut the first three paragraphs about Arthur Dantos and Warhol and so on. And I shouldn't right. have done that. And pressure and lack of experience as an editor on my part, completely on my shoulders. So sorry, Phil. Well, I've never said that I before. Mean, do, do you, how do you feel about the sublime now? I mean, are you referring to sort of Edmund Burke, uh, sort of his recontextualizing yeah. of it or? Uh, yeah, Barney Newman, Rothko, Friedrich. Right. Monk by the Sea by Friedrich in particular, 
um, the whole Robert Rosenblum take is a little bit iffy now. Um, uh, Northern Romantic painting and the sublime, that's, that's a bit tricky. I don't know when that book was published, about 76 um, by Thames and Hudson, but um, it's still, still a good read. Um, but there's a lot of things which you could put in there, Kiefer and so on are obvious yeah. examples. Yeah. Um, as I said, I was blown away as a young art student by the New Spirit and Painting exhibition, which Kiefer was included in. Um, there was a lot of duffers in there as well, the never rated Clementi and uh, or Kia and a few others, the Italians, but um, there, there's some good things going on um, that I would include within that label, the, the contemporary sublime, I guess, um, which I say I detect across the, the north in particular and northern Europe. And I think that's where Philip and I connected most. Um, in terms of our interest um but uh do you think it's possible now to 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 represent it or to, to find if people want to get out there yeah if people want to actually you know i'm not saying that every artist needs to become a storm chaser but <laughs> um i remember when one of the the first issue of that magazine um art north um we published there was a piece by myself um, about Sophie Morris's work in the uh, uh, being shown in Bermondsey, which was curated by Mel Gooding, and Mel wrote a piece as well. Right. Um, we did them back to back. Um, my whatever Mel was writing about, which was it was absolutely terrific, stonking piece. Um, what I was writing about is actually we we live in a culture where you know the sublime. We can get an app for that yeah and what sophie morris was doing with her work at that time on north uist was something really quite radical it yeah. was about you know a more than human experience and i think i don't know whether she would agree with me i've never actually asked her about this but um certainly there's a sublime aspect to her work um but again, you've made a connection. My thesis as a student was, uh, as an undergraduate at Chelsea, was um, uh, postmodern eclecticism and the sublime. Right. So it, it all comes full circle. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that you know, certainly in some of the pieces I've read, there is an indication of, of that throughout your observations of other people's work. It sort of that filters through for me. Um, oh, it's very kind of you to say so. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, I haven't dealt with your relationship with Cohen um, and these amazing things. I mean, there's uh, so much in here. <laughs> I could I could just talk about a number of things in here. <laughs> uh, just uh, just you know the fact that uh, I think you I can't remember the phrase you said but it was something like a uh, formalist criti criticism misses so much of the detail yeah and when reading you know this reading of uh, Cohen's pieces uh, again it it sort of reminds me of your it it strikes me rather it strikes me that you're particularly interested in the narrative of it the narrative is which is a bit tricky with an artist like Bernard Cohen, because of course he, he shuns the genre painting tradition entirely yeah. and, yeah. you know, won't would, even would use Would you say brush. that's true of you? Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, the, the first, the first um, monograph there was uh, Norbert Linton's and, and Flowers asked me to uh, provide an essay on the more recent works because sadly Norbert Linton died whilst he was working on it. Um, Did you like him? Cohen? Yeah, no. <laughs> well, both Norbert Linton. <laughs> I didn't meet Norbert. I didn't meet oh, Norbert. Right. I've never never met him. Um, Bernard then? No, not, not hadn't done. Um, but uh, yeah, Car Car Bernard Cohen is um, a lovely guy, um, a very genuine artist. Um, the second monograph, he kind of did a bit of a number on me. It's quite cheeky. He said about the first one. Um, he had a show coming up and he said, I showed that text you wrote to Robin Denny just before he died. And he said, this guy's got to write more about your work. And what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> OK, Robin Denny liked, liked the monograph. I'll get, my, I'll get busy. Yeah, OK, I'll get my pen. Hang on, I'll be back. 
um, but the second one, uh, to get serious for a second, I that book gave me a nervous breakdown. I, really? I was, you know, yeah, big time, big time. It, it was, um, you know, I don't want to get all heroic about it, but yeah, it, it really was quite wow. a wounding experience. It was a hugely pleasurable experience when it was uh, when it was published, but I completely fell apart at the end of it. It was a year's work, really, of just probing and probing. And of course, Bernard never wants to talk about what the paintings are about because they're they just are. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. And it's down for us to interpret what they are. But at the same time, I could see a lot of pain in the work. Um, that sort of, you know, as though the artist is working with imminent existential threat. And I think that's true of a lot of artists. It's true for an artist like Lucian Freud. You know, the, the reason to go on is the next painting. Yeah. What else is there? Is the yeah, well, again, that's, well. that's interesting because that's one of your uh, references with Beckett. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, this identity, uh, which made me think of a, a sort of a mantra in throughout the endeavours you've taken on. You must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. <laughs> yeah creativity being the means to go on i think that's something that maybe cohen and i share or shared in our friendship together because it was born of a friendship I, yeah. I hope it feels the same way um we're really in touch now but um it was uh yeah i mean i i share that same sense of like if you if you don't keep going what what else is there yeah Okay, yeah. Well, uh, I'm now going to bring us back to Eastern Europe because mm -hmm. you know, there's the events of of now are certainly demanded, and with your experience and knowledge of what's going on there. Um, oh man! As this morning, I interviewed uh, uh, art critic and artist um, in Lithuania um, on on Zoom as we are now, um, just for half an hour. I wanted her opinion. And I hope she didn't detect that I was getting emotional, but there's a big lump in the throat. And there is now, you know, she's, I said, what is the situation in Lithuania? Um, I also working with a translator that's um, in Ukraine, um, hoping to build some stuff up there, um, some dialogue there. And um, uh, Naringa said, uh, well, at the moment here in Lithuania, in Vilnius, um, we all have a full tank of fuel in our car. Our baggage is packed and we know where our LTV flow car to go and get them. Yeah. Weird. So you, not, you, you spent time out there, didn't you? Yeah. 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 Um, and the Balkans as well, not just east. No, so what took you there in the first place? Um, to the, the east, um, just because, uh, you know, um, Art Scribe sent me out there to find out what was going on in Czechoslovakia, right. as it was then. And um, I wrote a piece for them, uh, Route 66, uh, Route 65, Prague to Bratislava. So I looked at both the Czech and the Slovakian kind of dynamic. Um, I spent a lot of time working out of Vienna for Photo Icon magazine. Um, which eventually became one of those porn mags, but it originally it was a contemporary photography magazine. Yeah. Um, and uh, used that as a base to hop around Eastern Europe and then eventually dive down into the Balkans, unfortunately, for other reasons, but an art critic in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, uh, oh, do yeah. You, do you, various do you, places. Can you tricky. identify uh, a cut in the same way that you're sort of recording a culture in the north? Yeah. Can you identify a sort of culture that was and is part of that region? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's about the land. It's not, I don't get that in this whole Russian Laban's born type of kind of thing. It's not about that. It's more about how a transient community puts down roots, a young democracy like Ukraine. How do you create that infrastructure? And they've done it very well and it's being ripped apart. Um, and, you know, all the chatter at the moment, uh, media chatter is about what was Syria 
a, a, a proving ground for the strategy. Um, that's deeply disturbing. If so, and I think it may well have been, people are wondering about the uh, whether the nuclear button option is going to be um, invoked at some point. But before that, if Syria was, there's germ warfare. You don't just leap to nuclear. So that's a massive worry. But actually looking at it in geopolitical terms is one thing. Again, it comes back to social justice. Of course, we lived post Brexit and so and you know a whole load of other stuff going on, um, which there's not even time for you and I to get into. Um, we've lived through what the UK perceives and the UK media right, the media of the right in particular perceives as a refugee crisis. So hey, let's create a refugee crisis because it's not happening. Joe, well, it's happening here. What's the latest figure? Two hundred refugees compared to a million and so in uh, um, other countries. But um, yeah, we're. Do you, are you aware of? You um, need to stay destabilize it. Yeah, are you aware of Dennis Bowen's um, Celtic Vision Group from the sixties, fifties, and sixties? And his. No, I'm not. Sorry. No, no I'm not. So, Dennis was a, a a painter in the 60s and I, I he was sort of uh, I came across him on my foundation course and became right. a bit of a mentor to me he was sort of tashist one of the first abstractionists in okay. the UK yeah. um, and he, he set up sort of early galleries new vision center gallery and he started a group called the Celtic Vision Group and connected uh, Macedonia and Skopje and all of the Celtic sort of influences mm -hmm. and he took art from the west to these sort of um, transforming communist states effectively and got, right. got involved okay. with them in dialogue um, and was sort of engaging them in seminars and conferences and things like that. Um, and he was also part of a group, group called um, ACA, AICA, um, mm -hmm. the International Art Critics Group. Yeah. Encourage it, trying to encourage this dialogue. And I just wondered whether you'd ever come across it and whether that, that was something that... Um, well, yeah, that goes back to um, when Peter Fuller was getting modern painters together. Yeah. And um, I mean, he was holding salons up at Stolentoff in Suffolk and down in his place in Bath. Um, were effectively salons. Um, feminist writer Juliet Mitchell, um, Roger Scruton, of course. Um, uh, Anthony Clare was another one, I think. I talked to Scruton about it just before he died, and um, he 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 confirmed all the names. And sadly, in the move to Scotland, I lost the email. But um, yeah, there was a. I kind of have. I'm, I'm not saying this about Bowen, but I kind of had kind of a weird feeling about exporting ideas which is what Scruton and Fuller were doing and particularly I mean bearing in mind Fuller very quickly became a the critic for the Telegraph um, and was quite divisive in quite a negative way I think and rattled the wrong cages in Britain um, but what they were doing with uh, dissidents and the Samostat culture and so on in, in Czechoslovakia in particular was kind of a bit weird I remember ringing Fuller and he wasn't home one day and Stephanie's wife saying, I can tell you where he is, but you mustn't tell any Russians. And it was all seen as undermining communism. Um, I don't know. I'm not qualified to speak on, on Bowen, but it sounds absolutely fascinating. I'd like to see more about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can find you some other bits for it. But um, so now <clears throat> you're about to relaunch Art North Review. Is that right? <laughs> Covid killed it. Um, I killed it. I've, for the first time in my life, actually sat for four months sitting in an armchair thinking about who the hell I am and what I should actually be devoting my time to. It's of any worth whatsoever. Um, usually I'm completely on the go and I'm just coming out of my shell now. What happened with Art North was, um, it was, as I said, it was a victim of his own success in some respects. It was incredibly uh, expensive to publish. Um, our second issue got lost by a courier. Um, 
and we found that our printer in Ed Edinburgh at that time was outsourcing to Bristol for God's sake and then shipping it back up to Dundee and then I'd have to drive down and get it from Dundee and it just wasn't feasible I mean bearing in mind Dundee is like I'd leave at eight in the morning and I'd get back at sort of two in the morning mm -hmm. um, to pick the mag up um, and distribution was really difficult but then as I say Covid happened and all the art galleries shut naturally um, as we know, um, and the advertising revenue completely dried up. Well, not completely. There was some very kind advertisers that continued, but it was uh, it wasn't enough to sustain the magazine. And subscribers naturally, many of them furloughed, um, and many of them on a low income, um, needed to economise, and the subscriber base dropped by just over just less than fifty percent. Um, so it really wasn't feasible and I tried for a long time um, when we first set it up I asked David Lee the best way of going about it because I trusted his judgment and he said do everything yourself what he didn't tell me was that you'd be working 20 hour days well <laughs> yeah and, yeah, um, yeah so as you say I'm thinking of uh, well I'm not thinking I am doing it um, uh, art is it north gonna, is it going to change Oh yeah, it's got to change. So how is it going um, to be? You couldn't do that again. Now the economy hasn't recovered in the way that we need. We're living in very uncertain terms. Um, the house that I'm speaking to you from now has one fire in it that's lit, and we can't afford to heat it. I can't afford to heat it. Certainly. Yeah. Um, I, you know, having said that, I, I'm always quite sensitive to the fact that it, it looked the part, Art North looked the part. There's a lot of things wrong with it in every issue. I was just like be mortified when it came back. Um, but uh, the, but yeah, it looked the part, but it, it, there's just something, something wrong. It's not possible now. How's it going to be different? Um, well, it's going to be online for the first year. Right. <laughs> Um, and try and build up that buzz because of course I was building that buzz to actually build a subscriber base before we even launched and yeah. that took about nine months in the gestation period was nine months um, and uh, I, I'm not sure where it'll go could it could it be biannually could it be quarterly again what format would it need to be the paper stock where, where are we going to be getting our paper from what are the costs going to be I mean, you know, to be perfectly frank, as I closed it down with uh, really hard feelings about doing it, but I closed it down just under six months ago. And we've only just paid the printer for the last issue. Yeah. Um, it's uh, art publishing is phenomenally expensive and the mistakes that can go wrong. Yeah. Um, and particularly in a region where you can't just pop up the road to watch it come off the press. Because where it's being printed, I mean, if it's printed in Glasgow, that's uh, a day and a hotel away, and that all adds to the expense of the magazine. Yeah, yeah. you're staying overnight and coming back the next day from the north coast. And so, um, yeah, we had the last issue came back, and eventually our printer did confess that they changed the inks on the Litho press before they ran that issue, and it came back with 50% too much black in it. Oh, yeah. No. And I was just, and you know, you've got, you've got time sensitive ads. Yeah. You sure. can't, you can't order a reprint. It's got to go out that uh, week. Of course. Had I seen it coming off the press, had I been willing to up the price enough for us to go and see it coming off the press each time, stay in a hotel overnight, it, all those overheads that you don't consider, or many people don't consider, um, you know, it was, it was a recipe for disaster really. But my feeling was like, God, this painter's work or that sculptor's work looks so much darker. It's not <laughs> representative of the colour. Yeah. Now I know that everybody screws up. I mean, I've seen I've seen catalogues from the Tate in Liverpool where yeah. it's got little um, uh, printed apologies in the front. The, the apologies, this artist or that artist that is not true colour. But that was then. That was in the nineties. We're we're now living in a we're technologically advanced we don't yeah. have to have human error of adding 15 percent more ink um and not noticing yeah well um, so can you give us a, a sort of uh, 
a teaser of what you've got coming up to go in it? I'd like to reintroduce all the content that, that you've got all the mags there. Um, clearly, um, I would like to reintroduce all that content online. It's incredibly valuable. Um, yeah. And it covers that period through COVID as well. We were going for a year before COVID and we were going for a year after the last lockdown, you know, or into that year. Um, and it closed in September of uh, 2021. Um, I would like to get that content back online. I need to check it out with some authors because the success of the magazine, I mean, the success of the magazine is not me. If anything, I copped it up. Um, the success of the magazine, you know, the writers, Claire Henry, for example, um, I, Mel Gooding, who's no longer with us, sadly, have mentioned already. Um, Peter Hill, who uh, went through his own struggles with Alba, um, trying to keep that going. Um, and again, the art business kill, killed that, and he did immense work. Um, had a lovely piece by Murdo MacDonald in there, who, for my to my mind, wrote the... Uh, definitive text on Scottish art that every Scottish art student, probably every art student in the UK should be reading, which is the Thames and Hudson World of Art series, it's called Scottish Art. Um, some really good writers, I haven't named them all, and they know who they are and they'll always be appreciated and I hope that I'll be able to pay them again, though again, never paid them as much as I would like to pay them, it just wasn't possible. And I have to be realistic about that as well. If you, it, you know, it relied on a lot of kindnesses. Well, absolutely. But saying they don't profile. wrote nothing, but yeah. they weren't getting the rate they should have done. Yeah. Well, you and they gave profile yeah. and recognition to a whole load of artists across a wide area. So I'm sure it, it was widely appreciated. I'd like to thank you for your time, Ian. And well, no, thank you. And, uh, I hope it's been helpful to you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's been great sure. to talk to you. Good to know and very you know, informative. And uh, I wish you all the best with your, your next venture as, uh, with Pete, Art North. Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. You've been very kind. Cheers. No problem. Cheers.